Hi guys, happy Monday. Here we are again. I hope you're all safe and healthy. I hope you had a great weekend. And I hope you're ready to kill another week. Five weeks out of finals week, which means, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, actually, this week we're entering uh, the last section of our book, which again is an indication that we're getting closer. So um, stay strong, keep killing it, and um, the time will go by fast, uh, very fast. Just make sure you take advantage of it, okay? Uh, today, um, feedback from LO13. I don't really have any feedback. You did awesome. Um, I have no items to talk about. If you have any questions, you know, you can always uh, let me know. Chapter 14 for this week, which means LO14 by Sunday uh, midnight. And it has to do with the legal structure and terminology. Before I start talking about LO14, I want to remind you, for the ones that are uh, students here at SUNY Plattsburgh, that this is the second and last week of advising so if you haven't already please contact your advisor with your specific academic plan so you can talk about it okay for fall all right um legal structure and terminology as you can see so today uh we're going to talk about some basic stuff uh, and the function of the legal system and we're going to touch uh, things that are really interesting and really important for the EPC, exercise physiologist. Um, a lot of you may uh, wonder why, why is this important. And previous editions of books like ours didn't have anything like that. But things like the ones that we're going to talk about today are becoming more and more important. And I will try to prove my point uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, if you know, for example, the system, you can uh, take advantage of the system in a good way. You know how to use it. And you also you know how to avoid pitfalls. For example, in our case, injuries and claims. right? Uh, and uh, a term that I'm going to throw today, that right now, and we're going to talk about it today a lot, is standard of care. Standard of care. And our goal here is to understand that standard of care so we can promote professionalism. All right, so let's start. Uh, the law and the legal system. Uh, again, we're going to talk uh, about basics like the civil law, lawsuit, negligence, uh, negligence uh, claims, uh, contract violations, and on, so on and so forth. Negligence is a big word, a key term for us. Uh, for this chapter and in general for an exercise physiologist it, it really has to do with a failure from our part to act at a specific level and it has four elements that we're going to talk about later on and we're going to break it down we need first of all to understand as EPCs where uh, there are dangerous situations and how can we be proactive, right? And um, STEPS is an acronym that helps us identify areas that could be used by somebody to prove that we were negligent. So STEPS, the acronym. S is for screening. So you know in the very beginning we screen uh, the, um, the client to see if they are ready, right? Um, to start working with us and at which level. So if we make a mistake there, that could be proof of negligence. Testing. After screening, we test them. Right? So it can be a mistake during testing um, or it can be a mistake uh, in evaluation, which is pretty much the interpretation of the testing. And then we'll have two more uh, from the acronym STEPS programming, which is we take all that information that we gathered and we actually design that customized program. That's another area. And then supervision is the last one. Uh, supervising 
the client while they are performing whatever we prescribe, right? All right, st let's take a step back and talk about law, some basics that you may know, you may not know, but well, we're not gonna go into huge depth, so don't worry about it. So we have uh, four primary sources of law, uh, constitutional law that provides authority and um, to federal gov governments and states, statutory law, that has to do with uh, duties, has to do with the duties and the restrictions uh, of individuals. Uh, case law that we usually see uh, in courts, and administrative law, where we have specific organizations such as OSHA that we're going to talk about later on, that they were given rights to um, have power over making law for specific activities or situations we'll talk about it in, a, in, in, a, in a second one more side note about statutory law and us uh, there is um, as you may know a law called the Good Samaritan law right and under that we have immunity when acting in good faith right however that doesn't work doesn't apply on us when we're working so we have to be really really careful it doesn't apply on us when we're working so when we're not working and may walk outside and help somebody giving them some first aid that will happen while you are in your clinic or in your lab or in your gym and something happens while you are working then the Good Samaritan law does not apply so have that in mind All right now um, if we break the law uh, now into two main categories, we have criminal law, that is something rare for the ETC, for the exercise physiologist, but it could happen, for example, when we are diagnosing, you know that we're never diagnosed. We test, we screen, and then if something uh, is out of scope, we refer to a specialist. Right, uh, but the criminal law, you know, it has it's about individuals or groups towards society, and usually we end up with misdemeanors or felonies. But as I said, it is not something very common for us. What's common for us is civil law, and it talks about individuals or groups, right, and the rights and responsibilities towards other individuals and groups. So the plaintiff and the defendant. The defendant is the EPC. Usually, if something happens. And a huge example, uh, and the vast majority of civil law cases for us have to do with negligence, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. And negligence has to do with tort law, or most likely, because that's very common, with tort law and contract law. And we're going to break them down uh, both. Let's start with tort law. And this is something you should uh, know, right? So here we have uh, the law that talks about the legal rights, but also the obligations that have to do with injury, death, or any kind of civil uh, wrongdoing as a result of what? Of a wrongful act. However, intentional or not intentional, right? Or not intentional. And that usually ends in a monetary relief when you go to court. Uh, this one does not include breach of contract, but as I said before, something very common in for us is negligence. It does include negligence, and negligence can have. We have three types. We have intentional misconduct, which is a little bit difficult to prove. We have uh, negligent contact, which is the most common. And then we'll have the no-fault conduct, which is about ultra-hazardous um, activities. Not very common either. So negligent contact is the most common and the one that really affects us. Okay? Let's break down negligence a little bit uh, more because it has to do with the overwhelming majority of the cases against exercise physiologists. So here, a term that we should know and I already mentioned is standard of care, the degree of care that a reasonable and prudent professional would um, use under similar circumstances and that's what the 
it's ads we've tried to figure out and then compare that to what we did in trying to make a case or not. Uh, four components of negligence and that's really important for you to understand all four of them have to be proven in court in order for somebody to um, get the monetary relief or whatever they're asking for right legal duty there has to be an established relationship between us and a client let's say there's a contract to train them from that contract from that established relationship there's a legal duty one two breach of duty they have to prove that we perform substandard or we didn't act at all so again we this will be compared probably to a standard of care I would say three proximate cause whatever injuries or whatever happened out of this whatever negative happened out of this is directly um, related with that breach of duty that we just talked about okay so if I hurt my leg today, I have to prove that that happened because you didn't supervise me. Because maybe I hurt my leg going down the stairs. Right? So there has to be a connection there. And the fourth one is damages. Um, we they have to they have to prove that whatever losses happened because I I hurt my leg. I couldn't go to work. If I were an athlete, I couldn't practice or whatever. Uh, they're very well documented and explain. How you know they they um, uh, happen because of that negligence? So if they can prove all four of them: legal duty, breach of contract, uh, proximate care, and the damages, then they can make a case in court. Now, how can we try to avoid these kind of cases uh, of negligence tort? The first line of defense, as our book says, is the standard of care. Always provide. The standard of care and above the standard of care. The second one is use waivers, consent forms, and so on and so forth. And the third one is to uh, purchase uh, insurance, liability insurance. Not a lot of people appreciate that because they think they're okay, they're safe, but it's uh, highly recommended. Now, when you are uh, participating in sports, there are three main causes of injury or death. Inherit that we cannot really do anything about it. It's not preventable. Uh, negligence that we really care about somebody's fault, our fault, their fault, our fault, and their fault. But it's somebody's fault. And extreme forms of uh, negligence that uh, it's mainly uh, from our part, the defendant, and we're talking about uh, gross negligence. Okay. Now. The inherent uh, causes of injury of death that we, as we said, we cannot prevent, we can be covered with some kind of consent, uh, informed consent or agreement to participate. So if you want to work out in our gym, there's this uh, inherent um, causes of injury. You sign this paper, you understand that you still want to participate. That's covered. Negligence can be covered with a waiver. So when you go to a gym, for example, they ask you to sign a waiver. It says that even if the trainer makes a mistake, you're okay with it. You're not gonna go against them. Okay, that's probably something that is in the waiver that you sign. And the extreme cases of negligence, uh, there are no documents to um, do anything about it. Just try to avoid them. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the insurance coverage. We have general because there are multiple types. We have the general and the professional. The general is against ordinary stuff. The professional is something like, um, for example, doctors do, is for people who give advice or provide service. So if you want to be a little more covered, go for that. Some federal laws that are important for us and we need to know. Please keep up with that video. I know there's a lot of terminology and I'm, I'm hitting a lot of uh, points, but this video, I think, with reading the book, uh, um, it will be fine. It will be enough information to not only um, um, help you understand, but hopefully I'm not confusing you anymore. So we have sexual harassment laws that are important workplace, and then um, at the end we have the responsibilities and the rights of the client and ours. Okay, 
So sexual harassment, uh, we, I'm pretty sure we understand the definition. It has to do with both sexes in important uh, years, 1964, when uh, they first put in writing and the sex discrimination in the workplace. And for us, classic um, situations that may uh, be dangerous for something like that is when we're testing people. Like I'm testing your waist circumference, right? And I have to put a um, tape around you. We need to be careful. And spotting. Okay. I may need to touch you during spotting. How am I doing this? And how is, is, is this being perceived by the client? So tactile spotting sometimes is, is important, but we need to be very careful and explain before we do it, for example. OSHA guidelines, um, I'm sure you've, you've heard about OSHA guidelines and it has to do with uh, the, the safety of the worker. And a lot of times you talk about classic um, thing about those guidelines about pathogens. We're not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, but I, I want to just say that we also have HIPAA. And it's, it's big that it has to do with privacy and confidentiality of health information. And important year to remember is uh, 1996 about that. All right, apply the responsibilities. What, what rights and responsibilities? Which are the rights of the client? Um, high quality of service, respect, overview, to know, uh, have an overview of services, to know the qualifications of uh, us, the trainer or the exercise physiologist, to uh, know the risks um, and the client um, is entitled to, excuse me, health screening, um, to um, get time responses from us, and of course to expect confidentiality. Which are the responsibilities of the client, of course, because they have responsibilities if they give accurate information about their health, for example, or if they have an issue, um, to actually maintain the environment safe when they're working out with us, uh, and to notify us, you know, if they cancel an appointment or if they change their um, address or if something, if, if the health information changes. All right. We talked about tort law, right, which is under civil law, right? Now we said civil law has tort law and contract law. Let's talk a little bit about contract law. Contract law is a mutual agreement between us and the client. And because it's an agreement, there has to be some kind of exchange, for example, service for money. Which, if there are issues with that, we may need to go to court. Um, we have a lot of uh, employer and employee responsibilities and rights here, laws about, about that have to do with uh, discrimination based on gender, race, you know, disability. A lot of federal employment laws, I'm not going to go into detail. Um, uh, higher and pre hire laws, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1990 ADA. Both of them have to do with discrimination. There's the FCRA, applicants must give written permission to the employees if they ask for the credit uh, reports, credit scores, and stuff like that. Uh, 1988 Drug Free Workplace Act has to do with the drug testing program. 1963 the Equal Pay Act between the genders, the pay rate. Uh, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, you cannot uh, discriminate employees above the age of 40. Right? And Immigration Reform and Control Act, 1996, the, the employees have to have a complete eligibility ver verification, do the whole paperwork and the files of the new, uh, or new hires. And lastly, I want to talk about some facility procedures. You can have whatever procedure you want in your facility that is owned by you or somebody else and you work for them. The main point here is to adhere to that, uh, to those procedures and to actually um, be consistent. So uh, for us, an example is the Part Q or the Part Q Plus, right? screening. That's one that could be a procedure. Uh, how are we doing the fitness assessments? How are we doing the orientation? Uh, what's going on with the certification of our trainers? Um, how are we doing interpre interpersonal relationships? Uh, who's supervising and how? How we're uh, maintaining the equipment and 
blog, blog all that information. Um, how do we clean the facility? And then, of course, the emergency policies. What happens when there's a tornado? What happens when there's an accident? Right? What, do we have CPR? Do we have AED? What's the procedure with the forms? Do we call an ambulance? When do we call an ambulance? Does uh, who is signing those forms? So we need to be very specific. And if we don't know some of those things, of course, we ask a professional. We ask an attorney, a lawyer, who knows more about this. So, but if you're working for a facility, they have that, those things figured out. You just have to do it the way they tell you. If you want to open your own facility or, or your own company, you need to be careful a little bit in the very beginning, at least. In general, we need to be more proactive than reactive, as you understand. So, uh, I'm done. I'm done with this chapter. Uh, what I will try to uh, tell you here and make you understand is that, although it may sound a little bit boring for some, Right, um, it is important to know the system so we don't not to not only find ourselves in weird situations but also take, also take advantage of the system. For us, the most important things that we need to know is that civil law under civil law we have the tort law. Uh, under tort law, negligence is something that is has to do with the majority of the cases against exercise physiologists. So we need to be aware of the environment and when it is dangerous and how we can be proactive. All right, that, that's all for me for now. All right, let me know if you need anything. Uh, I think I covered everything. Email me um, if you need, if you have questions or concerns. Uh, I'm gonna let you go. Hope you enjoyed this video and you find it helpful. In the meantime, Although you may be still uh, inside, right? Lift intentionally, not habitually. Bye, guys.